Okay, I guess we'll get started. So, my name is Alex Thomas. Um, with me, as always, is Chris Palmer. Uh, and this is a gentleman called, named Chris Ritter. And we're here to talk about uh, the security of forensic software uh, and what it means for people who are trying to catch people who commit crimes and those of you who want to get away with crimes. So, um, go ahead and introduce yourselves. <laughs> no? No? I can just yell if the mic's going to be too much. Is that right? Can you guys still hear me? That's great. Cool. So we called it Vulnerabilities and Critical Evidence Collection, and we're going to talk about some interesting stuff, um, we think. So thank you so much for, for coming and filling up this tiny room. Um, so we'll do a little introduction about the stuff we're talking about. We're going to talk about the attack surfaces and attack classes of things that are interesting in forensic software. Um, we're going to talk about some of the bug finding techniques that we've used over the last several months to find some interesting bugs in the leading uh, forensics products. Uh, we're specifically going to talk about bugs we found in the Sleuth Kit and Guidance End Case, which we believe to be the premier open source and commercial tools uh, for forensics disk analysis. Um, this is the part where we have lots of slides that we'll probably blow through pretty quickly. Um, all of the details of the bugs are contained in the paper. Um, this is the point, you know, if you guys want to ask some questions and such and get detail here, that's fine. We'll probably have to shorten this a little bit. Um, then we're going to talk about Encase Enterprise. Anybody ever hear of that product? You guys, anybody here own it and use it? Yes. Yeah, oops. So um, we'll talk about Encase Enterprise. We're going to talk about cryptographic analysis of how Encase Enterprise works and perhaps some um, things people need to think about when they use it um, and perhaps that courts need to think about when they accept that evidence. Some conclusions. And then today you're getting a two-for-one bonus talk, extra bonus talk by Chris Ritter, who's just a gentleman here. He's actually a residential fellow with the Stanford Law School Center for Internet and Society, and a, a very smart gentleman. Oh, and there's Jennifer Granik. Why don't you stand, Jennifer, and wave to everybody. Hello. We'd like to thank Jennifer for, for hooking us up with Chris, um, for putting us together. Uh, when we were doing our, our work, we thought to ourselves, what does this mean? Um, and we also wanted to be able to make sure that if any reporters ask us, um, aren't you just helping child pornographers get off, that we don't have to answer that question? And so to help us figure out what this means for courts, we asked uh, Chris to, to work with us, and he'll be providing a 10 to 15 minute mini review of the state of the law as it comes to electronic evidence and how this kind of research might affect how the law has changed and how the law is, is applied to different products. So, any questions before we get going? Uh, the slides are not on the disc. What's wrong with the mic? Okay, I'm getting a little too echoey. Let's see. Is that better? Okay, great. Thank you. And it's still too cold, right? Sorry. Well, we're going to heat you up with the love of learning right here. So. <laughs> okay, so uh, here we go. The slides, I'm sorry. The slides and the paper are not on the, the CD due to some fun, fun... Um, vendor notification issues that perhaps some of you read about on bug track. We'll talk about those in, at the end of the talk. Um, but they are on the web, and thank you for the segue to make me jump ahead in another slide, okay? So I'll give you the URL in just a second. Here it is. Oh, you'll see it in just again. Okay, so introduction. So who are we? So Chris and I are researchers and consultants with a company called ISAC Partners. You may have seen some other talks today by some of our guys. Anybody here like being Brad Hill's talk, the XML, DSIG? Um, yay. yay. The VoIP talk this morning? Yeah. So um, we're doing six talks here, Isaac Partners. We're a security consultancy up in uh, San Francisco and Seattle. And uh, we're really happy to be here. And we love the Black Hat folks, so we're happy that ha they have us here. We're both working consultants. We're not full-time researchers. Uh, so the work we did part-time, it's part of our company. We have all our consultants doing research uh, when we can give them time to do so. And that helps us be better consultants, and it helps us be better researchers that we actually see bugs in the field that are real. Um, and the, the big peg here is, if you have a resume, please send it to I, careers at isaacpartners.com. And we'll send you a lovely auto response, and perhaps a job. So um, please do that. OK, so what are we talking about? Uh, we're not forensics experts. We're not forensic examiners. We don't go around uh, catching people. But we do do some forensics to help our clients with incident response and to help them. They've had a couple. We have some clients that have had some incidents where we've tried to help them figure out what's going on and then fix the holes in their software that cause it stuff to happen. So as a result, we've been exposed to forensic software. Um, and we own uh, a legal copy of NCASE uh, Forensic. Uh, and we use the free, you know, the free open source uh, sleuth kit. And we've been using them before. And we kind of realized while we were using these products, 
hmm, this is kind of interesting. These products have ridiculously hard, large attack surfaces and happen to crash at random times, which seemed to be an interesting uh, fact situation. Um, forensics people aren't security experts. Uh, and vice versa is the true, right? Uh, almost everybody, nobody in here, I think, is going to be able to match wits with Officer Bob, the computer cop, at any you know, reasonable metro police department uh, to discuss the low-level file format of Outlook uh, data files or to talk about how to recover the MFT from a damaged NTFS partition. Likewise, Officer Bob has no idea how software works and has no idea how security flaws work. And I think there's kind of a, one of the things we're trying to do here is bring the security and forensics community together uh, to talk about the quality of the products that are being do, using to do the forensics um, and to help the security community get exposed to the things that our law, law enforcement officers, that lawyers and, uh, and civil defense experts, um, that all those folks are using on a day-to-day -day basis because uh, it doesn't seem to mix too much. So we had a little bit of mixing because we bought these products and we decided, hey, let's have some fun with them. And the way we had fun with them is we kind of used the standard way that people do black box penetration testing. Um, we tried a lot of fault injection. We tried looking at it with a debugger, with disassemblers, all that kind of stuff. Um, and actually, within about the first two hours, once we got the fuzzers working, we found the first bug. Um, so there's definitely some issues, and that's what we're going to discuss today. Um, we've later, through some more intense analysis, found what we think is a pretty large flaw and kind of speaks to the fact that the forensics and security people don't talk to each other because it's the kind of thing that you would hope would have been found uh, three or four years ago when that flaw was actually introduced to the marketplace. Um, so the paper and tools, as you asked, sir, are available at isecpartners.com slash blackhat. Actually, the tools package, we're going to be releasing a 16 megabyte tar of Python scripts that allow you to generate all kinds of nasty EXT2s and NTFSs and nasty PDFs and stuff like that. So we basically used a lot of the fuzzing tools that are already available from isecpartners.com, including file P, um, written by Jesse Burns. Wave, Jesse. Um, which you can go download right now. Uh, file P's actually been used by other people to find. Somebody found an OS 10 zero day using it after Jesse released it on free. So please go use our tool and find zero days in other people's products. Um, and we'll be releasing a package of tools that you can use that specifically target forensic software. Uh, and that should be hopefully up by tonight um, if we can get the website to work. So, and the paper's up there too. And we spent a whole lot more time on the paper than the tools. So please consider the paper canonical. You mean the slides? This, I'm sorry. The paper's in the slides, yes. The tools, the tools, then the paper, then the slides are way below and the amount of work that was actually spent. So please go read the paper because uh, it should be much more interesting, canonical, and has a lot more fact. Um, the slides are pretty much devoid of fact, um, as most slide decks are. So uh, what's interesting about uh, forensic software? So forensic software is absolutely ridiculous in the size of its attack surface, right? We're, you're talking about a product that is designed to take a huge chunk of data from a bad guy, and by huge I mean 100 gigabyte disk images, and it takes this 100 gigabyte disk image and it understands that the tool, like one of the commercial tools, advertises being able to read about 10 file system formats and over 270 different file formats, right? I mean, that's a huge number, 270 different. I can't even name 270 different file formats. And, uh, you know, you're talking WordPerfect 1 and original Lotus 1, 2, 3 files. I mean, they can read anything. Um, and that's terrifying, and it should be terrifying to people that use these products. I mean, if you think about Microsoft Word, which is written by some pretty competent people and has one file format that it can open, it's had, what, half a dozen remotely exploitable buffer overflows in its parsing routines? So think about something with an attack surface two orders of magnitude larger than Microsoft Word. And you start to think about what the problem that forensic manufacturers face. Um, it, this is also interesting because these products get updated on a very, very quick schedule. And the people that write the, the filters that understand the files often have to do so from reverse engineering. They don't do it from any specs. Um, for example, NK 6.6 .6 just came out, and one of its big selling points was it could read Office 2007 files, which is not something that they figured out by going and ask, asking Microsoft for the code. It's something they had to figure out by reverse engineering how the Office file format works. I mean, as you can imagine, maybe that doesn't get you the most robust code when you spend all this time reverse engineering file formats and then putting that into your system. So the attack surface of forensic software is huge, and this needs to be understood when, we, when you kind of take our research into perspective. Um, because what we did was look at a very, 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 very small slice of the attack surface and found some interesting bugs. And my expectation is that there are many, many more bugs like the ones we ta were talking about all throughout these products 
that all you have to do is get as esoteric as you want to be able to find them. Um, go find something really weird. So let's classify what the bugs are against forensic software and what the impact is. Um, so evidence hiding is something that's been talked about before. This is kind of the standard anti-forensics thing, which is, can I perhaps create a file system that is interpreted by the operating system in a way that allows me to access data, but my, the forensic software doesn't see that data, right? Um, there's been a bunch of attacks like that. And these bugs get fixed. Um, I'm not talking about things like stenography or encrypted partitions, but we're just talking about, you know, can I do something funny that maybe Linux can deal with or Windows can deal with that guidance can't, that NCase can't or the, the sleuth kit can't. Um, so these bugs have been found before. They'll be found again. Um, they're just basically because it's, it's almost impossible to write a piece of software that looks at all these file systems the same way the operating system does. Um, and what is the impact of this? Well, it's obvious. If you can hide your evidence in plain view, uh, then maybe you get away with something, right? Um, code execution bugs. This is uh, of, of interest in, you know, in the black hat audience, people always want to see blood on the floor, right? And the blood on the floor they want to see is, is remote arbitrary command execution. Um, we are not claiming remote arbitrary command execution today. For all you reporters who are looking to misquote me, uh, please listen to that statement. We are not claiming remote command execution. What we are claiming is that we have found lots of memory corruption bugs. And it is an exercise to the reader to determine whether these memory corruption bugs can become exploitable or not. Um, because I've seen what happens when people go up on black hat stages and say they have an exploit and they can't produce it. Um, and say that that person is then, you know, attacked by a blog storm. Fortunately, uh, guidance doesn't have the same people backing them up as Apple does. Um, so I'm guessing that I'm not going to have 10,000 blog messages about how I'm an idiot tonight. Um, but this is an important point, right? We're not claiming remote uh, arbitrary execution. What we're claiming is that there's lots of bugs. And odds are, when you find lots of bugs that cause memory corruption, somebody who spends enough time looking at it is going to be able to turn into an exploit. I, I certainly think that the evidence that we have supports the idea that people need to prepare for uh, remote command execution in forensic software uh, with co from code hidden within these hard drives that you, you grab, which is a totally uh, reasonable thing to prepare for. And I think some people that run forensic shops that we've talked to, like perhaps the FBI, uh, is thinking about this, and some people who, 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 who do, do not, right? Most people don't even think about this. Uh, and the excuse we hear all the time is our forensic workstation isn't hooked up to the network, so it really doesn't matter if you have arbitrary code execution. Right, so maybe you run on a VM and you reboot it. Because we all know that virtual machines are a perfect security barrier, right? <laughs> See other talks. And, and that's, that's a smart move. I, I'm not saying it's not a bad move. I'm just saying I don't think people, the reason people do stuff right now when they set up the forensic labs is not because they think there's malware running around inside the lab, right? It's to do things like they can set up a VM so they can say that nobody else has touched the machine since they last used it. So that's obviously a class of bugs that we're not going to talk about too much more, but people need to be aware of. Um, and then a kind of weird bug is denial of service. What happens if you can deny the ability of somebody to look at a hard drive with a certain piece of software. Now, the standard way, I mean, most good examiners would probably be able to figure out if they keep on opening up a hard drive in one program and it keeps on, their program keeps on crashing, that they're gonna to have to use something else. And it's highly unlikely that denial of service attacks would, over, would overlap with different products. Um, and so maybe this doesn't have an impact on people. Um, I, I certainly think it's something that can be worked around in a situation where you can't open up the whole hard drive. Where it gets interesting is if you can't view a single file. Right? If you're an examiner and you've got 500 files on your de image files that you're looking at and you're paging through them and you look, you look, you look, you look, all of a sudden there's an image file you can't view, are you going to think out of those 500, the one that's corrupted, are you going to go find another product to go view it? I'm not sure. And so denial of service might actually be an interesting thing for people. Um, it's certainly also an interesting thing because you know, we've gotten some excuses from the vendors like, Oh, well, that denial of service can be fixed by taking a hex editor to the drive and stuff. If, if Officer Bob was that handy with a hex editor, these products wouldn't have to exist, right? And that's not an insult to Officer Bob, but Officer Bob is a trained law enforcement officer. He knows about the law. He knows about evidence. He knows how to collect it. He doesn't have to know what, what exactly which bits do what within the NTFS file structure. Um, and so uh, something to think about is, is what the impact is. And if we're not talking about the impact. Chris will later. So what are the techniques for finding bugs? Um, one thing you can do is go do random fuzzing, right? Uh, this is not really a sexy thing. I mean, people have been talking about fuzzing for, 
for many, many years. Um, but it turns out that just randomly fuzzing files and feeding them to forensic software is very, very effective in causing lots of crashes. Um, so effective that it's almost certainly happening on a day-to-day -day basis to people who are just using these products and opening it up corrupted hard drives, uh, which is supported by the, if you go read the user forums for some of these products, and that you see that every day there's about a dozen different postings, my product just crashed, here's a screenshot. Um, you know, the, the robustness issues and parsing these things and looking at files have a real effect on people even who aren't being intentionally attacked. Um, I think there is an interesting issue of if people start finding uh, exploits that run against these, these, you know, start releasing exploits that run against this software, um, whether or not if you're an examiner and you do your examination and the product cl crashes 15 times, whether or not that's going to be something interesting the defense attorney asks you about, right? How many times did your product crash? Oh, about 15 times or so. Did you write down when it happened? No. Did you write down EIP? No. Did you save, did you save dumps? No, it just crashes all the time, right? Um, that might be an interesting conversation to have. So. And then, uh, you know, fuzzing's good, but in things like file systems, they have a very definite format, and there's lots of things that are kind of obvious to a human being might be bad. Things like if I have a very deeply nested directory, if I have loops in my directory, um, there's lots of little games you might want to play, and it turns out this is also a very effective way of finding bugs. Just think of if I had to write an NTFS parser, I had to write ext3 parser, what mistake would I make? And then try to find that mistake, try to exp uh, express it. Um, just pushing the corners of the corner cases of the file systems. So Chris, you can start talking about this. Hopefully my microphone is working. Am I cool? Okay, so our, we, we used a fuzzer called file P, which uh, Jesse from ISAC invented. And it, here we just list some of the mutations that it does, which we use to cause various types of trouble. And it's pretty much, they're mostly pretty simple, and they're, the notable thing is that they're completely blind to the specifics of any data format. We just like, oh, swap a byte with null, increment a byte, make up a funny 32-bit word and drive it around in the file for a while, stuff like that. Um, and it turns out that that's, there's probably deeper and more interesting bugs present, but this got us plenty of stuff. So simple is certainly effective. Um, now there's, file P offers more mutator functions, but we had to take some out because as it says, um, things like file systems depend on specific alignment of uh, specifically sized objects. And for example, if you fuzz a, a, an image by just taking a 32-bit word out or adding in a random string, that would change all the offsets, and that might ruin it beyond recognition, and you would miss bugs by doing that. So that's about as smart as we got, was taking some stuff out. Um, now, again, we did some additional stuff by hand, and we'll get to that. Um, yeah, so if you perturb it too drastically, you'll end up with just noise instead of interesting noise. So what do we target? The tax service is huge, as Alex said, and we have day jobs, and this was all done in between doing paid work for real clients. Um, so this is, you know, we just sort of did some stuff when we had a free week here and there. Here's a free day, let's do something. So we totally have not even really scratched the surface, the huge attack surface. So we just picked some of the most obvious targets, NTFS, FAT, EXT2, obvious document types, obvious image types. Uh, email databases are kind of interesting. For example, Exchange Network Express are kind of tricky, whereas Thunderbird is just a big giant inbox file with a little index file that helps you find individual messages in it quicker. And one thing we noticed, and it makes perfect sense, is that uh, the simpler formats tended to have less trouble. You know, FAT never really caused us any trouble in our fuzzing, neither did Thunderbird's email database. Whereas things like PDF, doc, NTFS, um, it's pretty easy to, to make a mistake in programming a thing that understands those formats because they're horrendously complicated. And that's all part of the fun. So, and again, we didn't even touch weird things like Targa image files. Um, pick a weird format. There's a million. What if you used a funny file system? There's probably more bugs there. RiserFS, for example. Who knows? They had... So... Um, 
that's a, a amusing area of future research. So, but we did get specific, as Alex said. You can, as a software developer, you can imagine what might go wrong when you're trying to read a partition table or when you're trying to read an MFT entry in an NTFS file system. Um, so we tried to do specific things um, that seemed likely to work. Um, so due to how our testing procedures were, we would make these fuzzy file systems or fuzzy files or fuzzy disk images and just feed them to the forensic tools in, in the normal acquisition process and then the normal, if they survive the acquisition process, try to analyze the file system as you normally would and just keep doing it until you hit something and it makes it explode. Um, in the case... That's, that's uh, the answer to that question is yes. Um, one thing we did, and we'll get to that in future slides, um, there's a, a funny interaction between different implementations of these formats, like what does Windows believe NTFS is? What does one particular Linux driver think it is? What does Encase think it is? What does the sleuth git think it is? And sometimes it's the case that uh, a fuzzed disk image is useless in every situation or that it causes crashes, or Linux won't mount it, or whatever. Other cases, Linux can handle it, or the sleuth kit can handle it, but one of the other things can't handle it. But there are some circumstances in which you can have a, an attacker can have a usable disk image, a usable disk, which NCase or the sleuth kit can't handle. Um, and in particular, we've got a NTFS one, just like that. Um, so yeah, and then one of the fun ones was the directory loop. Creation. And we'll, we'll show the specifics of that one later. Um, but it, it's just, an, again, an obvious thing that could go wrong, is how you're going to handle directory loops. So, so when you talk about whether or not it's, so this is another kind of excuse that you'll see from the forensics vendors, oh, that doesn't work, right? Um, so when you talk about a file system, maybe if you're messing with something that's pretty key, like the MFT, then maybe that's true. But if it's something like, I put an exchange database that's corrupted on my machine, if I'm not running the exchange server, I don't care. But a lot of these products and the default configuration, when you do an acquisition, it does what's called the signature analysis, in which it goes and finds all the data it can. Um, you know, the whole point of these products is to make it easy for you to find all the data, right? Then it will go and find every exchange database and parse it, even if it's not an exchange server. And so certainly if a forensic examiner turns off all the functionality, uh, that won't be exposed. And so there's kind of a balance between putting things on there that are just there for when somebody comes around with uh, you know, forensic software that reads 300 file formats and some of it that actually affects the working of the disk. There are also things like if I put multiple partitions, if I do loopback uh, uh, file systems, um, if I want to, you know, some of these examples, it broke NTFS but it worked in Linux. So if I want to hide my data and mess with people, then I just use NTFS with the NTFS 3G driver in Linux. So it, it's kind of more complicated than just does it work or not. There's lots of different scenarios. I, I guess with most of these things, if you are a determined enough attacker, you can make it work for you. That's what I'd say. Yeah. Sorry. So here's a couple more uh, specific manual manglings we did. Just obvious stuff, long file names, directories with a million things in it. And one of those paid off, you'll see later. Um, deeply nested directories, what's it going to do? You, and again, you can, you can create an image by hand that uh, no operating system could handle, but that's not necessarily the relevant thing. It could just be a booby trap for an examiner. So the Sleuth Kit, it's a open source Unix-y forensics toolkit from Brian Carrier. Um, Is Brian here? No. Because he comes to Black Hat a lot, so. Cool. Okay, well, he's really cool. Is Brian here? <laughs> no, he, he really is cool. He's friendly. So um, it's like, it's in the Unix tradition, it has a million little programs that each do their one job. And it's up to the examiner to write uh, shell scripts that put it together and pluck out things that are interesting to them. So it's more nerdy than um, for normal people. But it's quite nice. And so it's got 23 individual programs, and we found uh, four of its tools had problems. And again, we only, we just did this in our off hours, and there's probably more trouble laying in wait. But um, you can see here from the names and descriptions of the tools, 
uh, that each tool really does just do one thing. Like iCat, all you do is you tell it, here's a disk image, here's a number of an inode, or in the case of NTFS, an MFT entry. Please just look in this image and pull that one out and cat it. And then doing something with that is up to you, like feeding it to your PDF reader or whatever. Um, iStat, again, it's like kind of like stat, only it works forensically on a disk image, and so on. So the Sleuth Kit is open source, which of course is wonderful. It allowed us to do, it, had, it, it gave us an easier time in testing. And specifically, um, we could actually fix uh, problems that we found, or work around them quickly, and then do further testing. Because when you're, when you're blindly fuzzing like we did, you'll often hit a problem immediately that is really masking a deeper problem that also is present. So we were able to, in a couple cases, hit a, an instant problem and then close it off and then find another problem that we found because we had now passed the first thing. So for that reason, testing and feeling good and verifying open source software is just super easier than closed source software. And we think that that has a serious security impact. Not that open source software is always better, or that it's even true that it's um, a thousand eyes make bugs shallow or whatever. But in our case, we were able to take advantage of the benefits of open source to good effect. So here's the first bug. It should be probably immediately obvious to everyone here. Um, it's pretty straightforward, and a fix is also obvious. But if you just feed a funny, now we, you know, in the paper, I urge you to read the paper, you will see exactly what data object triggers this bug. It might be, um, I think it's from FLS, but the paper will tell you. Um, so we have here, obviously, referencing data after we freed it, which, depending on your allocator, may cause trouble. Um, and now here, another similar type of bug. Yeah. Um, so here we made a, a corrupted NTFS image. And there's a lack of bounds checking here. It's trying to treat a 64-bit number as an offset. And um, it loops for probably not indefinitely, but that's a long time. Lots of Fs in the high order bits of that number. <laughs> so we didn't wait a long time for that one to finish. Uh, and again, that's GDB with symbols, and that's just so great. Um, so here's another one. N uh, corrupted NTFS image makes iCAT, the program that, like I said, will just print out the file referenced by some inode in the image that you tell it to. iCAT will crash trying to pull out the data. You can see here that we're going to have a, a bad dereference, because what we do is we check that FS data run is real in that while loop at the top. But inside the while loop, it may become not real. If the next pointer inside it points to nowhere, we later dereference it anyway. So again, a uh, relatively simple bug, simply fixed, and having source code makes it a no-brainer. Um, and again, NTFS yet again. It keeps popping up. Uh, FLS, the program, which, what does FLS do? Lists the file and directory names in a given file system image, including the deleted files. A handy tool. Are we, yes. So, oh, I, I didn't, uh, oh yes, this one is a two-part one, so there's no highlighting. This is just the code that sets up the problem. So, we're copying data in FS data put stir ntfs.c. The read buffer is atter plus an arbitrary 16-bit offset, and the read length is an arbitrary 32-bit length. So it's possible to read 32 bits worth of stuff out of 16 bits worth of stuff, which is obviously not going to work if the number is too big. And you can see here, this um, you may not know because you may not be familiar with uh, the code of SleuthKit, but all these functions, we're going to see them a lot, like get u48, uh, get u16, get u32, they will pull in the next number out of the file system image that you reference in the endianness that you tell it to. So this is user-controlled data. So 
A lot of file systems have structures like here, there's about to come a file name, and it's 10 bytes long, and then there's some stuff. So, and then these tools often either do because they have to, or do because they couldn't think of anything else to do. They often believe those numbers. Like, oh, I've been told to read a 4 billion bytes. Okay. And then they do. Um, so, one of our main points of this presentation is that people writing this kind of software need to be super paranoid. And the entire file system is attacker data. And it's super complex. And it's full of stuff that's going to contain stuff that will affect the program flow or the data that's retrieved. So here we take, as said, user data and treat it as a too big of an offset to a too small buffer. Um, now, I'm going to... Um, NTFS, FLS, NTFS is the cause of so many problems um, in these tools because, because it's extremely complicated, even more so than the Unix file systems, which are also amusingly complicated. Um, because we have a time issue, how are we doing on time? We have a lot of bugs to go through that are along these lines. We should probably have finish all the bugs in 10 minutes. We should, we so should we probably finish. Yeah. OK, so I'm going to start zooming through these a little quicker. But again, all the details are there in the paper. So let's move on to, OK, in case. Another, uh, it's the, we believe it's the leading um, proprietary closed source um, forensic toolkit. Unlike Unix, it's very Windowsy. It's a GUI. It uh, integrates all the features that you would want into that one GUI. And you are to use it pretty much that way. It does include for programmability its own built-in programming language called Enscript, which is uh, vaguely C++-y, vaguely Java. It's, let's say it's an object-oriented programming language from the Algol family. It's, a, it's its own little thing. Um, and you, are, you can take a class and learn it. And uh, so where the, the, where the functionality between um, the sleuth kit and Encase is the same or similar, we found the same or similar types of bugs. Um, and then in case goes further than SleuthKit, as we'll see, it has uh, features for viewing the stuff that you find in the, in the evidence image. So where it has more features, it also has more bugs, um, as you would expect. Um, so it's very difficult to test and deal with. Um, it's closed source, but that's normal. But beyond that, They've encrypted the binary with nice bonus features for you. Um, it does try to do a little bit of anti-debugging. So like if you try to launch it from WinDebug, or probably some other debugger, it can tell and it gets angry. And you can't do the simple thing of setting um, am I being debugged in the PEB to zero. It, it, it doesn't believe you. So it's got something else that it's doing, but it doesn't really matter that it's doing this because all we do is just attach WinDebug after in case is fully started up. And then we can just debug it normally. Um, and then it also has a little copy protection dongle. And so uh, when Tim was going to do some testing on it, we would work around that problem just using FedEx. Um, but it was still a pain in the butt. And it's, we had the problem where we could not um, patch away the, the first hits from fuzzing. Um, in theory, we could have you know, done a binary patch, but we didn't. That might be illegal. Yeah, that, that might count as reverse engineering or yeah. copyright infringement. I don't even know. So being nice people, we didn't do that. Um, but you know, similarly, crashing, incorrect parsing of data structures. And it acts a little weird. Um, SleuthKit's a little more predictable, but in case, has a mind <coughs> of its own sometimes. Um, but here we go. A disk image with a corrupted MBR partition table can't be acquired at all. End case just hates it. So um, this one's kind of, there's a couple facets to this one. So we, we took a, um, a disk image and mangled its MBR partition table. And we tried it in two ways. It's a Linux file system, or Linux volume of file systems. And so we thought we would, and in case has this thing called Linen, which allows you to, it runs a little server on a Linux machine in case the target of your uh, investigation is a Linux machine, you put this linen thing on it, and it will feed over the network 
the disk image to a in case running on Windows. It's kind of you know DD and Netcat, kind of what, just what you think. Um, and if you if you corrupt the disk image before feeding it to Linen, Linen in case won't handle it very well at all. It will crash in a way that you can um, get out of. Or not not crash, I should say. It, 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 it just, it just, you no, don't it's have just to. off the boot disk. Yeah, you don't have to. Um, in case will hang when you feed it that funny image through linen, but you can quit out of that acquisition and you're not uh, totally lost. But you never can acquire it. Um, but, but if you. Um, I'm sorry, sorry? You can't do any analysis. You can't acquire it. You can't acquire it. We didn't get to analysis yet. It can't handle this partition table at all, even in acquisition. So you, you can't acquire the physical disk. Why not? Because for some reason it reads the MBR. And it hangs. So it's doing the preferred. I don't. I don't. I don't. I didn't write it, sir. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, it doesn't take, it's not like DD, it's much more complicated. I guess maybe in somewhere it decides what, how many partitions there are. Even if you tell it, I want to grab just the physical, it makes the decision, yes, there's this many partitions in the MBR, so it flips out at that point. So you can't use Linux at all, you'd have to use DD, which DD does work. Yeah. So, um, but if you, if you corrupt the, di the disk image after Linux has started feeding it to Encase, Encase will hang in a way that you can't recover from, just kind of a... Now we didn't um, we didn't do a lot of looking into linen itself because we just noted this funny issue and just sort of went on. But it might be something worth looking into, you know, testing linen itself. Um, so here's the uh, the partition table in question, and it has a bunch of partitions, and we I've elided some, but the one in red is the funny one. Its start and end is way past the end of the disk. But it's the same size as all the others, as you can see. I think they're all 43 sectors long. And Linux will boot with this as long as it's within one of the non-corrupted partitions. Right. So you can't have a running Linux machine that then Linux won't, won't acquire it all. For the obvious question. Here's more detail on that particular messed up partition table entry. Um, here's another one. This is NTFS again. Um, so NTFS in the MFT, the master file table, there's a bunch of different, there's an arbitrary number of arbitrary sized records describing each file. But one such record is called the file record. And it's expected that that 61 is normally a zero. But our fuzzer just put 61 there by chance and we happen to run into trouble here. So um, we'll see in the next slide that that number is used as an offset to a, um, an allocated memory region that it makes it 61, 30 makes that memory region, makes a memory reference go out of bounds to that region. I apologize for the tiny, tiny, tiny words here. But again, the paper, you can look at it, put it right up to your face. Um, but you'll see that, I believe it's EDI. Yeah, I have the laser pointer and everything. Only I don't see the. Yeah, EDI, right here. It's, uh, it starts from a base of 02CE0000, um, which is the address of the allocated blob. And then it believes our number. It's got 6132 there. And then you get a out of bounds dereference, and it dies. So one little byte makes it so that it, it can't, uh, you can't acquire that file system. Out of bounds read. Um, similarly, okay, is this similar? I think this one might be different. Okay, yes, this one is a little different. This is post-acquisition. Um, we made a fuzzed Microsoft Exchange email database, and in case has features to um, read through those, which is cool. And when you acquire it, you can say, oh, hey, please do um, look for Exchange mail databases and look for other types of stuff. And um, we just, as a general matter, just to find as much trouble as we could, we always made a habit out of just checking all the possible search, hash, and sign signature analysis options, even though um, we didn't always have the relevant type of file. Um, so we could have done more work to 
um, isolate exactly which checkbox triggers the feature that has this bug. But that's not really super interesting to us right now. Um, so again, we have a read access value, I'm sorry, a read access violation. This time it's EAX instead of EDI. But the funny thing about this bug is we took a lot of, we ran this one a bunch of times, and the particular value in EAX changes. You can do the exact same GUI movements and give it the exact same input files, and uh, it'll crash in a slightly different, it's the same EIP every time, and it's the same problem of a uh, out-of-bounds dereference, but the exact place it's trying to go is a little different each time. Just seems kind of weird. Don't know why. Um, let's see. How are we doing on time? Yeah, like two minutes. Two minutes. I want to skip ahead to, yeah, that one's not too awesome. This one is a good one, and I'll spend my last two minutes on this. Um, so in case in Linux, again, what do you know? They interpret an extremely complicated data structure in different ways, because there's multiple interpretations of it. NTFS in particular, if you don't already know, it's really redundant and really flexible and pretty strange. Um, so there's, it makes sense to me there's lots of trouble here um, with NTFS. So we manually, manually created a directory loop in an NTFS file system image and then gave it to Linux using the 3G driver and we gave it to Encase and they both handled the problem differently. Linux sees a directory loop, boop -a doop just like you would think. A, chi a child is its own parent. And in case, there's no loop. And the file that supposedly is itself, or its parent, I mean, it's there as a file, but other files in the same directory, in case, just can't see them. So there's a chance there for an attacker who likes to use Linux and the 3G driver to hide his evil evidence or whatever to make in case miss it. And it will be, um, he could extract it in his own way, but in case would not see it. I'm sorry? A perfectly reasonable question, and we don't know. We didn't try. Um, Windows would probably oh. fix it in like a check disk. Right, sorry, yeah. The question was, can Linux handle this file system? I'm, I'm sorry, can Windows handle this file system? And we didn't check. Um, but you can check yourself because coming up is specific. So here is the uh, a portion of the file system image, the part of the MFT entry. The stuff in blue and red is the specifics of this entry for a file called readme.txt. And um, for example, the file reference, 5D, some zeros, 01, 00. That would normally be the, uh, the reference to where the file lives. We just changed it manually to 5C, which causes it to refer to its parent. And then you have to change related information. Actual and real sizes are zero to be a directory. And flags are changed to be suitable for a directory versus readme.txt. Um, so you can try to mount that on Windows and see what you get. Um, is that my two minutes? Probably. Basically. Yeah. Do we have the extra partitions bug in here? Yeah. It's, uh, that one's oh, just kind of funny. This one's cool, too. This one's cool. <laughs> Give me one more minute. <laughs> so this one is strange. Um, if you make a, a directory structure that has super deeply nested directories, like uh, you know several hundred or several thousand children inside, um, we were able to get a crash in which EIP is controlled by us, partly. Although it's not as exciting as it sounds. Although it's really weird, as you'll see. Um, we think it's due to an optimization. Rather than having to recurse um, and do whatever its directory handling function is every time it sees a directory, we think that it optimizes when there's only one directory that's a child. It does it immediately without recursing. Um, let's see. I'm going to skip ahead. So what happens is you can control the value of EIP with the number of directories that you nest. Or the, this EIP is related to the number of uh, nested directories. But as you can see, it's way too low to be anything. CA. No instructions or anything useful there. <laughs> so that was uh, rather strange. Uh, and then finally, this one's really quick. If you just make a disk with too many partitions, Linux can see it, and in case stops after the 25th. So here, uh, FDisk in Linux says, oh, hey, cool disk. 
And you, in case shows us some of the partitions, and we stop at 25. This in case is, runs out of letters. Yeah. And then after acquiring, <laughs> they're just not there. <laughs> so that's kind of curious. Um, and then these you can and should read the slides. But I'm going to give it to Alex to discuss in case enterprise. OK, so you guys probably don't have too many questions about that. I, you can go to the details in the paper. But basically, bugs that hide stuff, bugs that crash it, and sometimes bugs that crash it with memory corruption that uh, if you play with it, maybe or maybe not cannot be turned into something worse. Um, so those are bugs in how Encase deals with data it has. And kind of the standard, you know, uh, the standard forensics workflow for a lot of people using Encase, especially in the law enforcement environment, is you go with your guys who kick down the door or something, uh, and your SWAT team goes in, and then somebody comes out behind them and grabs the, the computer, and it's got a hard drive in it. And the examiner, the, the tech, takes the whole computer, and they wrap a bag around it, and they put a sticker on it, and they sign their name to it. And they take it to a lab, and that's where they take it apart. And they see that the hard drive comes out of the computer, and they say pretty reasonably, hey, this is the hard drive that belonged to the suspect's computer. And they slap a label on that, and then they put it up to a, hard, uh, a hardware write blocker, which are things that are tested and approved by the uh, National Institute of Justice often. And they use that to pull the drive down, and they copy it, and they do an MD5 at real time. And they're pretty darn sure that from all the way from somebody kicking down the door down to it getting into end case, um, that this is the hard drive that was moved that belonged to the suspect. So that's great. And that works for, for law enforcement in some cases. But that's not a workflow that, that's very convenient for some people. And to, to help the people for whom that, that workflow is not convenient, there's a thing called end case enterprise edition, which I saw a lot of hands raise up in people who have used this product or, or seen it. Um, Encase Enterprise Edition is based around Encase Forensic, and for the most part gives you exactly the same uh, user interface and features as, as Encase Forensic. Um, the one thing that's kind of added on is the ability to get hard drives remotely over a network. And there is network acquisition in case, uh, in the regular Encase, but that's like Linen, where it's supposed to be a, a crossover cable, right? It's really just kind of like, instead of using a parallel cable or a USB or something, you're using a crossover network cable. There's not supposed to be anybody else on the network. I'm sure it is a completely insecure protocol, but who cares when it's in, you know, physically next to each other with a cable between them. In any case, enterprise is designed to be used on a normal corporate network during the day while, while people are going about their business or perhaps in the middle of the night. Um, and, and so that, that's the whole point. It, it provides you remotely, you're able to image a machine remotely, and that means grabbing the memory, looking at the running processes, and then grabbing stuff uh, off the hard drive. Why do you want to do that? Well, if you're a big company, oh, and, and, and why does Guidance sell this? Well, Encase Forensic is a $6,000 product. Anybody want to say how much Encase Enterprise costs? I'm sorry? It's a six-figure product, yeah. Sure, theoretically, you can get it for $27,000, but that's like trying to buy a, a three series for 30 grand, right? If you want the chairs, it's, it's more. So from, from clients of ours that have used the product, they have quoted us numbers in the, the mid six figures. Um, it's an expensive product. And perhaps it's worthwhile for people uh, because it is very convenient, right? If you're a big global enterprise and you have 50 offices around the world and you have your one information security team, if, if you need to read a hard drive in Budapest, you do not want to put that person on a plane. Right to go seize the hard drive is much easier. You can download the slides, sir. You don't have to uh, uh, take pictures with your camera phone. But um, uh, he's got a Homeland Security shirt. That's awesome. Taking pictures with the camera phone. Uh, uh, it allows you. you know, so that's obviously a very very convenient thing. Um, it allows you to do instant response on a running server, right? To seize a hard drive, you usually have to turn the machine off. While there are live system forensics that you can do to a disconnected machine, if, say, I think a machine's broken into, but I don't know if it, if it was, and I don't, if it's a very important thing, like it's my SAP server or my PeopleSoft server, I can do forensics in real time on it without ever taking it down. Right. Um, it allows an investigating of ongoing crime without telling the subject. Now, I've been told that doing this uh, might have some legal implications, but say I think Bob is embezzling, if I grab a snapshot of Bob's hard drive every night while he's gone, maybe that will allow me to put up more and more, you know, better evidence of what he's doing. Um, and maybe it allows you, if you're a paranoid employee and your employer uses it in case enterprise, maybe it allows them to go on fishing expeditions without you knowing, right? If they think somebody in accounting is doing something bad, in case enterprise makes it really easy to pull down everybody's hard drive in accounting without somebody running off their screwdriver. Um, so this is why it costs so much money. Um, is NCASE Enterprise only used for internal corporate uh, investigation? So uh, we have heard evidence uh, from people that 
uh, the evidence collected by NKS Enterprise has been used in people's prosecutions. And guidance actually cites some use from law enforcement uh, who have been, uh, I guess Chris can talk about this, encouraged to use NKS Enterprise because it is less invasive than going and kicking somebody's door down and taking their hard drive. Um, also, I'd be suspecting that NKS Enterprise actually used a lot in civil litigation, right? Uh, when, when we've talked to lawyers about electronic evidence, a lot of them have said it's used way more in civil cases. Most criminal cases, there's no electronic evidence. But there's no big civil litigation between two big companies these days where there's no electronic evidence, right? There's going to be email or stuff on people's hard drives and stuff. So I'm sure in that kind of situation where it's civil discovery, everybody's friendly, there's no kicking down of any doors, no SWAT teams, which I'm sure the gentleman in the Homeland Security Department is really sad in those kinds of situations. But, um, you know, that kind of stuff doesn't happen. You want to have a nice, friendly way of doing it that doesn't interrupt business operations and in case enterprise would be great. So does that mean that NK's Enterprise provides the same level of protection of, of, of confidence in, as, as somebody going and grabbing a hard drive. Well, this is kind of something that is a little bit danced around by guidance in their public documentation. Um, there's a document called uh, Authenticating NK's Enterprise Evidence, which is a legal document written by their chief counsel and their chief legal officer. Um, and this is a quote from it, that NK's Enterprise is ideally suited to recover and authenticate data over a local or wide area network in many cases, the use of NK's enterprise is more than merely acceptable, but in fact constitutes best practices, right? So they're pretty much saying using NK's enterprise is as good or better than just using NK's forensic on a machine, on a hard drive that you have in your hand. So this is the standard that has been set for us to talk about NK's enterprise today. Why should we trust evidence that's grabbed over the network, right? Every, I don't have to say in this room, networks are bad places, including big corporate networks. Now, that sounds obvious to everybody in this room, perhaps it's not as obvious to a judge. Um, but networks are bad places. And to make you f think, feel better about this, NK Enterprise uh, Edition has a rather complex crypto system, which is used during the network acquisition portion. Um, now, this uh, NK is, is not an open source product, as everybody knows. Uh, and they're under, I guess, no legal obligation to pro uh, completely document their network protocols. They do have a couple of documents that describe these network protocols. Uh, at least one of them uses like, lots of pretty pictures and no map. Um, so it's actually kind of difficult to figure out how the product works, right? You can do a, a, a packet dump, you could uh, get Wireshark and look at a bunch of e uh, Ethernet frames. That's a very difficult way to reverse engineer a crypto system, right? Um, fortunately for us, uh, guidance was issued two patents by the United States Trademark and Patent Office, um, and patents are public domain and freely available from Google. So if anybody wants to see them, we have them up here. But the patents are very, very good descriptions of a enterprise capture process. Now the words in case enterprise are never used in these documents, right? Because they're patents of general methods, not patents of protect specific products. But it kind of makes obvious sense that they would patent their money-making product. And it turns out that if you look at the publicly available information, including a sales document that Guidance uh, very nicely provided us, um, that those public documents that say this is NK's Enterprise Edition correspond to one-to-one -one with the, the information in the, in the patents. So I just want to kind of set the stage that our analysis was done through information from patents, publicly available information from Guidance, observation, um, and you know testing things where, where possible. Um, so that's how you have to analyze something like this. It's not really properly documented. And we couldn't find any place in which you know, a lawyer had gone and, and made guidance turn over the real specs for their, their crypto. Uh, but I think we're, we're, we're as close to, we're, we got as much as we needed uh, to do a proper analysis. So when you design a crypto system, the first thing you have to do is you have to sit down and you have to decide what it does, right? Lots of bad crypto systems out there exist because people miss up their goals, they think, I want confidentiality when what they really want is integrity, right? We see this all the time. If you're a web application and you want to have a cookie that has the user's user ID in it, should you encrypt it with a stream cipher? Do you really care? Is that a secret, the person's user ID? No, it's something that when you send it to a user, you don't want modified. So it needs to be integrity protected, not confidentiality protected, right? And that's why you use something like the HMAC instead of like a stream cipher where bits can be sent. And so, to, to avoid those mistakes, you have to sit out and say what your goals are. Um, it's difficult in these documents to find the actual goals of the crypto system. We sat down ourselves and thought, if this was my product, what would I want to do? I would want to authenticate the machine that was targeted to get the hard drive from. 
I would want to keep that, the contents of that hard drive secret as it flew over the wire. I would want to keep the contents of the hard drive from being changed as it flew over the wire. And I would want to make sure that the person that grabbed that hard drive off of that computer was both authenticated and authorized to do so. It turns out that the NCASE Enterprise System meets all of these goals except the first one. It does not provide authentication of where the hard drive came from. Which, if you think about what the purpose of this thing is, which is to grab people, people's hard drives to either fire them or send them to jail, perhaps that's the one that is the most important. That's an arguable point. Um, but we would say it's actually very important. So um, I'm just going to go through a quick, these are actual images from their patent application, which is uh, a very good way of us explaining how the crypto system works. I'm going to do a quick run through of how it works and then point out the specific thing that we think is a flaw and then we'll talk about what the, the impact is. So we're not going to go through the entire crypto system. Um, basically what you've got in the NCASE Enterprise environment is you have individual end users, which in this case are called clients. These are the people who are the, your examiners in the, in the company. You've got the vendor who is guidance and they've got some server oracle uh, sitting on the web. You have your server. This is called the SAFE, S-A-F-E, something like secure authorization for NCASE. Um, this is a server that sits and runs all the time. Hopefully it's physically secure. This is basically the trusted introducer and the gatekeeper that decides whether or not a person is allowed to grab a hard drive, right? So you have a server, a bunch of keys on it. It has a, an admin interface that allows you to configure who can do what, and it knows who all the users are, and it sits out there to authorize people and to introduce them to the target. Um, you have the key master, who we're not gonna talk about, but that's basically like a, a super user. And then what they call the target machine is also called a servlet, which is an overloaded term for all you people that do Java stuff. But in case calls to, to make this stuff happen, you have to put a little piece of software on the target machine, and that piece of software is called the NCASE Enterprise Servlet. So if I use the term servlet and target machine interchangeably, I apologize. So basically what happens is this is during the initialization of the crypto system. Um, you install the safe. The safe generates a bunch of keys. It sends them to the vendor. There's a human in the, there's a human in the loop process by which you say, Yes, I'm the person that bought this product. I'm not sure exactly how it works because we haven't done an install, um, but I'm guessing that it's fine. There's a, a human in the loop process where guidance then signs the safe keys from the server. Now, this little arrow is a kind of a mystery to us. Somehow, the individual target machines are told of what the public key is of the safe. This may be through some network process. It looks like from what we've observed, they actually roll a setup.exe they roll a binary for the servlet that has the public key burned into it, which would be a totally fine process. Um, so we won't comment too much about this because we're not sure exactly how it works. That is how it works, okay. Because I've seen also in some other situation, it's not for me, that's a version issue. So you roll a binary after you do your install. Now I'm able to get a setup.exe from the safe and that, set, if, uh, that setup.exe I push out to all of my users, right? A lot of enterprises that use NCASE Enterprise have the servlet running at all times on all of their desktops. Because they don't want to have to make any changes to the desktops that they have to do an investigation, right? They just want to go and do it and pull the hard drive down without authenticating it and pushing out the servlet. So imagine in our scenario, every single computer inside this 10,000 person enterprise is running the NCASE servlet at all times, found at port 445, uh, it's just a TCP port. So this is the initialization of the install. When it's time for me as the examiner to do a acquisition of a hard drive, I have to authenticate myself to the server. This works fine. This, this process works fine. The server authenticates me, it looks me up in a list, not some kind of authorization database. It says, okay, Alex is asking for access to grab Bob's computer. He's in the list and he's allowed to. Okay, that's great. So it does that. It generates some session keys and it sends it back to the client. I'm sorry, I, I kind of missed the point. The client has, every single, single examiner has a licensed certificate, public-private key pair that has to be bootstrapped with the safe. That's a totally secure process, it's fine. So basically, I'm introduced as the client to the server. We create a trust relationship and we create some symmetric keys that we share with each other. Works great. This is where it, it, this whole system falls down. Now, the process of putting servlets onto individual computers is that is a couple ways. You could put it in your standard build. You could use like an Active Directory group policy to have them automatically installed. You can use a little GUI inside of NCASE, which does a DCE RPC call to push down 
set up .exe and then run it on the targeted machine. Um, you need to make sure you're using NTLM v2 when you do this. That's a possible issue if you don't have a secure Windows network. Not a big deal, that's not Guidance's fault. Um, that Windows authentication protocols aren't that good. Um, but no matter how you do this, every single machine in that 10,000 person enterprise is given the same setup .exe file, right? It's binary identical for every single machine, and that's an important point to remember, right? Because what does that mean, if it's identical for every machine? It has nothing special about it that's known before it's put onto the individual machines. Right. It's, so, so now we've got 10,000 machines. They're all running the servlet service. And the safe has received a request that I want to grab Bob's computer. So it generates a random number. It signs that random number with its private key. And then it sends it to the target, right? The target verifies that random number generates its own, and then sends the two random numbers back encrypted with the safe's public key. What's the problem here? Initialization vectors. Not initialization vectors. Let's assume the, impl the implementation is correct. This is a, a trust introduced, you know, I'm, I'm trying to establish trust with this target machine. It's only half trust, right? All, we've, I, all we have verified is that the safe has a public key that is known by the servlet, Nothing that is done here in this package that comes back to the server, nothing in it is different depending on which, which computer you go to. Sure, there's a random number, but the random number is just random and there's nothing to verify against that. There's no signature, there's no shared secret, there's no name, there's nothing in, that, in that, this bootstrapping that identifies the target machine. And so, and then we do a couple more things and basically what this does is we generate a um, session key that is given, the, the safe generates a session key, it gives it to the target, it gives the same session key to the client, and then these guys can talk to each other because they're now sharing the session key, right? The safe is a trusted introducer. It's a server that both sides trust, and it tr introduces both sides. But when it does that introduction, it does no verification of who the target machine is. So what does this mean? Well, well, redirect it to another host. Redirect it to another host, yes. There is no authentication of what machine you're talking to in NCASE Enterprise when you pull down a hard drive or grab its memory image. NCASE is relying on the idea that if I take a DNS name, bobscomputer.corp.com, and I resolve it to an IP address, and then I send a packet to that IP address, it's really going to get to Bob's machine. Or you specify the IP address. Or you specify the IP address. Right, which a lot of people do. I'm sorry? Okay, so we'll get to that. So basically, the only thing that actually gets verified is that the, the client machine sends an IP address to the target of what it's expecting. So the target servlet looks up locally in the registry, what's my IP address, and it checks that that's the same. Okay, great. The, the practical effect of this is that standard network attack uh, techniques allow any person on a switched Ethernet network to redirect a request to NCASE Enterprise to a virtual machine under their control or a physical machine under their control. And we can talk through the scenarios in detail, and you cannot believe me if you want, but basically what it means is if I'm Malice, and I'm on the same Ethernet network as Bob, and Alice comes to get Bob's hard drive, I can grab that packet, send it to my virtual machine, and now Ma Alice gets my, my, my hard drive. I'm sorry, that doesn't work. What doesn't work? Right, you can't do a direct like network port redirect. You have to do something like an ARP spoof because the machine you hand it to has to have, has to believe itself that it has the same IP address as Bob's. Yes. We've tested taking different machines, giving them the same IP address and it doesn't figure it out. Right, because all it's going after is the IP address. So, so, all right, this is all, this is all great information. Yeah. Right. I'm working for a corporation that has 300,000 employees. And I'm saying that maybe 100% of the people in here have the capability. That narrows me down to less than 1%. Well, we're going to make it easier. Okay, well, I'm, I'm not saying that people are. Okay, so the tools that. So right now, there are tools that allow you to do DNS spoofing in a corporate DNS environment. 
There are tools, I can, if you use bind in a DHCP server, you could do all this just through race conditions because like the magic fairy protocols, right? The same magic fairy that allows your, your computer to work when you plug it into the ethernet port and the magic fairy comes and sprinkles the magic fairy dust and there's all these magic protocols that make everything work, right? You get an IP address, you get a DNS name, you get a DNS resolver, all of a sudden you're able to figure out the MAC address of your gateway. Those are all insecure protocols and that's been known for a real good long time. DSNF, can enable, ARP spoof, um, all the DNS attack tools. So the basic problem is, and, and you're right, if now if Alice looks at that virtual machine, she might be able to figure out that it's, it's not Bob's hard drive, right? Because it doesn't have Bob's files on it. Or it's got, it doesn't have the proper stuff on it. Or it doesn't look like it's been used correctly. The problem here is using NCASE Enterprise is not the equivalent to a police officer going to the floor of a building, right. walking over to the computer and grabbing the hard drive. NCASE Enterprise is the equivalent of a police officer going to the floor of the building, looking out at the cube farm, and saying, who here has Bob's hard drive? And the first person that comes to him with a hard drive, he takes it and he puts a sticky note that says, this is Bob's hard drive. Now, that, in that situation, the person could still look at the hard drive and try to figure out whether or not it's Bob's, but there's no authentication via the, the, the way he got it that allows him to do that. Right? And I'm not going to speak to the legal implications. Chris will do that in just a second. But I don't think that's what people's assumption is when they type in the name of the machine. Right? Okay. So there's basic flaws here. Um, we all just sit on the network, network thing. Obviously, also, the NK servlet isn't really hardened against reverse engineering at all. Um, it's actually linked against debug symbols, the production one. Um, so if you're examining somebody who's an advanced user, it would not be that difficult to take a normal Windows rootkit and modify it to understand what the NK servlet is and make sure to feed it a hard drive that, you know, maybe, I, maybe that the rootkit now hides a couple processes and hides the second hard drive, right? NK only sees physical drive zero, doesn't see physical drive one. Hey, so uh, that's a standard problem. Yeah. Right, so um, suggestions, there are a couple ways there's no way to, to solve the problem of I go to somebody's machine and ask it, give me your truthful hard drive. That's not possible without a trusted computing base. You can make it much more difficult to quote unquote frame somebody and to, to mess with acquisitions over the network. You could use Active Directory Kerberos trust relationships that already exist to bootstrap that protocol. Um, and you could also do like a registration thing where the servlet generates a key pair, it registers, Keeping that mapping between I'm Bob's computer and that key pair might be hard, but at least that creates an audit trail that you can go back and check if you think that anything funny has happened. Um, right now, our suggestions are, if, 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 if it was us using Intercase Enterprise, I think it's fine for using for incident response on a production server. It's fine for initial investigations or fishing expeditions or whatever you want to call it. Um, an initial look at your, your marketing department, you're probably fine. Um, if you think somebody's doing something illegal and you want to prosecute them, I would strongly suggest getting the physical hard drive later so that you can prove that you grabbed the right image. Um, I would do all of your court testimony on that physical image. Um, I would be very careful investigating your system administrators uh, using NCASE Enterprise because it is pretty easy to trick if you're the local admin. Um, and save that the Im either the image or the physical disk itself that you got from the physical process, save that forever. Do not use NCASE Enterprise and then put the desktop back into circulation, right? And I know that sounds obvious, but we've heard that that has happened, right? That people just assume that the NCASE Enterprise image is good enough, so we don't actually have to grab the desktop. Uh, anyway, so our conclusions from all this study, the forensic software vendors are not paranoid enough. They do not use coding practices that are commensurate with the danger that they face from parsing such uh, data that's under a control of bad guys. Um, they do not take advantage of all the protections for, for native code. Um, in our paper, we outline the fact that the use of the Aladdin token for NCASE Enterprise makes it impossible for NCASE, or for NCASE Forensic, makes it impossible for NCASE to use the anti buffer overflow protections provided by Windows. It turns off DEP and it turns off stack protection because they're doing a packed binary for anti reverse engineering. So that token makes them more secure against copy protection and makes you less secure against buffer overflows. Um, forensic software customers do not use security as an acceptance criteria when evaluating software, right? Um, this includes the government, which does all these tests, and if you look at all the government tests, not one of them is about security. They're all about software following through and doing exactly what they expect when they give it a, a controlled data set. So they test, can NCASE copy this hard drive? They don't test, can NCASE copy these 100,000 randomly fuzzed hard drives? Um, because that's a hard thing to, 
that's a hard thing to write down as a rule, right? Um, but that kind of QA doesn't happen. Um, the software and methods for testing forensic software need to be more public and complete. The fact that nobody's talked about the NCASE Enterprise stuff since it came out like three or four years ago is because it's not well documented and there was no cryptographic review by, by open cryptographers. And it seems to me if that you're going to be putting people in jail because of crypto, that you should have you know, some PhDs looking at it uh, openly and judging whether or not the crypto system works. And um, the acquisition of system images over a corporate network is inherently dangerous. I know it sounds like we're beating up on guidance. We look at them because they're the leader. I'm sure all of the other products that do the same thing probably have the same issues because it's just a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, actually impossible in one case and very difficult to do in other cases. Okay, so I want to thank Tim Newsham and Jesse Burns who are our collaborators on this and our interns. And now, um, Chris Ritter. So the way this happened is we were doing this research. We were wondering what, what it's gonna, the impact was going to be. So we called Jennifer Granick and we called the EFF and they both told us about the same person. And so we called that person up and he did some legal research. Um, and these are his findings. And if you guys want to turn the tape off, but we're at the end, so I think people should be able to listen to the lawyer, um, which would be, I think, the interesting part of the talk. So, Chris, why don't you give them a little spiel? And Chris's paper is available from our website as well, uh, if you want to download it and read it. Do you? Yeah, I can do that.